Hello friends, today I will just explain you about a very interesting chapter of cultural relations with uh, India with the other nations. We are just specifically discussing on Europe and Indian culture and what are the influences of Western culture on Indian culture. Let us begin with that about specifying the Indian culture's characteristic feature in that. As we all know, Indian culture is an ancient and dynamic entity spanning back to the very beginning of human civilization. Beginning with a mysterious culture along the Indus River and in inferring communities in the southern land of India. The history of the subcontinent is one punctuated by constant integration with migrating peoples and with the diverse culture that surround India. Placed in the center of Asia, Indian history is a crossroads of culture from China to Europe and the most significant Asian connection with the cultures of Africa. Indian history then and more just a set of unique development is a definable process. It is in many ways a microcosm of human history, itself a diversity of cultures all impinging on a great people and being free forced into new syncretic forms. Human society emerged slowly. Over thousands of years, primitive cultures slowly evolved into civilization. From 400 BC to 500 AD, the economic, social, political activities of the human went through many transformation. By far, the most important change came in the form of economic revolution. Moving from nomadic hunter-gatherers to farmers, humans converted their entire patterns of life. Their needs and wants changed completely and the new economic existence drove them to develop new social and political institutions. During the Neolithic revolution, approximately 10,000 years ago, bands of hunters-gatherers began to form agricultural villages. In river valleys, certain villages grew prospered and produced broader cultures. The need for trade, protection and irrigation moved groups to interact and pool resources into formative civilization with cities and social institutions. As civilization developed resources, they formed economic interdependencies, built great public works of architecture, organized spiritual beliefs into religion and created bodies of literature and scientific and technological knowledge. When we say Western civilization, there are so many thoughts which comes in your mind. Just make it simpler. Here I'll quote a historian Carol Quigley, writer of Evolution of Civilization, who contended that Western civilization was born around 5480 after the total collapse of the Western Roman Empire, leaving a vacuum for new ideas to flourish that were impossible in classical societies. In either view, between the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the Renaissance, the West experienced a period of considerable decline known as Middle Ages, which include the Dark Ages and the Crusades. The knowledge of the ancient Western world was partly preserved during this period due to the survival of the Eastern Roman Empire. It was also greatly expanded by the Arab world and mostly by the concurrent ascendancy of the Islamic Golden Age. The Arab importation of both the ancient and the new technology from the Middle East and the Orient to Renaissance Europe represented one of the largest technology transfers in world history. Since the Renaissance, the West evolved beyond the influence of the ancient Greeks, Romans and Muslims due to the commercial, scientific and industrial revolution and the expansion of the Christian peoples of Western European empires and particularly the globe-spanning empires of the 18th and the 19th century. Since the age of the discovery and Columbus, the notion of the West expanded to include the Americas, though much of the Americas have considerable pre-Western cultural influence. Australia, New Zealand and most countries of Latin America are considered part of Western culture. 
due to the former status as settlers colonies of western christian nations generally speaking the current consensus would locate the west at the very least number of the countries which are there or the culture and the people of the europe north america namely canada us mexico australia new zealand and most countries in south america there is a debate among some as to whether eastern europe is in the category of its own god knows culturally eastern europe is usually more or less accepted into the west mainly because of its geographic location in what is mostly europe However it does not fill the traditional economic and living standard criteria typically associated with the west when we talk about the term culture its literal meaning is what how you cultivate or build oneself cult or built in multi directionally that is ethically socially even in all aspects of that lead human development every culture is enriched with some good and bad features indian culture is rich and diverse and as a result unique in its very own way our manners way of communicating with others are one of the important component of our culture even though we have accepted modern means of living improved our lifestyle our values and beliefs still remain unchanged a person can change his way of clothing way of eating living but the rich values in a person always remain unchanged because they are deeply rooted within our hearts mind body soul which we receive from our culture when we talk about western culture it is referred to as an advanced culture this is because its ideas and values promote the development and sustainment of advanced civilization western culture has had quite an influence in india but it had its pros and cons too there are many good things in the western culture which we have adopted but why do we see only the negatives even the indian culture has influenced the western world the globe is shrinking and we are all getting closer to each other in many ways so it's quite natural for us to adopt their ways and for them to adopt ours western culture has affected almost every dimension of society the core religious traditions are still the same but the lifestyle differences can be found because of western culture hence we can say that western media has not affected the core tradition of indian society but has changed lifestyle and apparent characteristics of the society india is the world's most ancient civilizations nowhere on earth can you find such a rich and multi-layered tradition that has remained unbroken and largely unchanged for at least 5000 years boeing low before the onslaught of the armies and elements india has survived every invasion every natural disaster every mortal disease and epidemic the double helix of a genetic code transmitting its unmistakable imprint down 5 millennia into no less than a billion modern bearers indians have demonstrated greater culture and stamina than any other people on earth the essential basis of indian culture is religion in the widest and most general sense of the word an intuitive conviction that the divine is immanent in everything permeated every phase of life says stanley walpert indian civilization has enriched every art and science known to men thanks to india we reckon from 0 to 10 with misnamed arabic numerals and use a decimal system without which a modern computer age would hardly have been possible science and philosophy were both highly developed disciplines in ancient india however because indian philosophical thought was considerably more mature and found particular favor amongst intellectuals the tradition persists that any early scientific contribution came solely from the west greek or particular because of this iranianist belief which is perpetuated by a wide variety of scholar is necessary to briefly examine the history of indian scientific thought too jawaharlal nehru wrote in his book the discovery of india till recently many european thinkers imagined that everything that was worthwhile had its origin in greek or rome 
From the very earliest time, India had made its contributions to the texture of Western thought and living. Michael Edwards, author of British India, writes that throughout the literature of Europe, tales of Indian origin can be discovered. European mathematics and through them the full range of European technical achievement could hardly have existed without Indian numerals. But until the beginning of the European colonization in Asia, India's contribution was usually filtered through other culture. Many of the advances in the sciences that we consider today to have been made in Europe were in fact made in India centuries ago. Grand Duff, British historian of India, Dr. Vincent Smith has remarked, India suffers today in the estimation of the world more through the world's ignorance of the achievements of the heroes of Indian history than through the absence or insignificance of such achievements. Swami Vivekanand has pointed out that every civilization or culture has a particular life center, a dominant characteristic or trend. According to him, the life center of Indian culture is spirituality. By spirituality is meant a way of life oriented to the ultimate purpose or goal of life, which is the realization of the Supreme Spirit or God. He says, Indian civilization is more than 5000 years old. During this long period, it produced a unique type of highly advanced and variegated culture. In spite of the numeral, innumerable regional, social, linguistic diversities of the country, there has always been a basic unity in Indian culture. Moreover, this culture maintained unbroken continuity from Vedic times to the present day. In spite of countless wars within the country, invasions from outside, two centuries of subjugation by the British, this indestructible unity and unbroken continuity of Indian culture are derived from its deep spiritual foundation. Now the question comes in our mind that how are we connected to the Western world or how come the Indian culture is connected to the Western world? The answer is simple, Buddhism. European contact with Buddhism first began after Alexander the Great's conquest of Northwestern India in the 3rd century BC. Greek colonists in the region adopted Indian Buddhism and synchronized it with aspects of their own culture to make a sect called Gratio Buddhism which dominated the area of ancient India, compromising modern-day Pakistan and eastern Afghanistan for several centuries. Emperor Ashoka sent Buddhist missionaries to the Hellenistic world, where they established centers in places such as Alexandria, creating a noted presence in the region. An interest in Buddhism had been circling among academic circles in modern Europe since the 1870s, with philosophers like um, Arthur Schopenhauer and Frederick Nesches and esoteric minded scholars such as Helena Blavatsky, Europe has in recent time been increasingly receptive to modern Buddhism as an alternative to traditional Buddhist precepts. As far as the continuation of the Buddhist philosophies goes, let's cover it by taking these countries one after the other. Begin with France. Buddhism is widely reported to be the third largest religion in France after Christianity and Islam. France has over 200 Buddhist meditation centers, including about 20 sizable retreat centers in rural areas. The Buddhist population mainly consists of Chinese and Vietnamese immigrants, with a substantial minority of native French converts and sympathizers. The rising popularity of Buddhism in France has been the subject of considerable discussion in the French media and in academy in recent years. Although there was regular contact between practicing Buddhists and Europeans in antiquity, the former had little direct impact. In the later half of the 19th century, Buddhist, Buddhism came to the attention of Western intellectuals and during the course of the following century, the number of adherents has grown. There are now over 3 million Buddhists in Europe, the majority in Russia, France and United Kingdom. By the late 1990s, it has been estimated that there are more than 140 Tibetan Buddhist meditation centers in France alone. The first Tibetan Buddhist communities in France were established in the early 1970s. 
the highest ranking head of schools to reside in France. Etty Fende Kenshin established his temple of E. Wong Feng in 1973. He is of the Nog uh, school of Buddhism. Buddhism in France growth was catalyzed by visits in 1973 and 1974 respectively of the Karmapa and the Lai Lama, two of the highest Lamas. In 1975, the Dzoms Rinpoche and the Do Kense Rinpoche, also very high Lamas, visited Dordog, where they established retreat centers with the help of Pema Wangyal. Rinpoche's Pema Wangyal Rinpoche is the son of the Kangyal Rinpoche, another high Lama who was one of the very supreme Lamas of the Western world. Kalu Rinpoche is also a highly esteemed Lama, led the first tradition three years retreat for Westerners in France starting in 1976. In the Kagyu lineage, such retreats confer the title Lama on those who complete them. It is estimated that 60% of the centers and monasteries in France are affiliated with the Kangyu school. There are about 20 uh, retreat centers representing all the different schools as well as many town based centers which are under the direction of great Tibetan Buddhist masters. Dhakpo Kundriol link in Ogwen is said to be the biggest Buddhist monasteries outside of Asia. The second center we cover Russia and Austria. These are the only two European states today that recognize Buddhism as an official, though not necessarily, state religion in their respective countries. On top of that, Russia also recognizes it along with Islam, Judaism and Orthodox Christianity as native to Russian soil in 1993 constitution of Russian Federation. All other religious groups are unrecognized and must officially register and be subject to rejection by the state. Apart from Siberian Buddhist nation, the Kalmayak people's 17th century migration into Europe has made them today's only traditionally Buddhist nation west of the Ural mountain. They now live in the Republic of Kalmayakya, a Russian Republic. Next country in line is Scotland. Samya Ling Monastery in Scotland which celebrated its 40th anniversary in 2007 includes the largest Buddhist temple in Western Europe. There is an associated community on Holy Isle which is owned by Samya Ling who belong to Kangyu school of Tibetan Buddhism. The settlement on the island includes the center for world peace and health and a retreat center for nuns. Samya Ling has also established centers in more than 20 countries including Belgium, Ireland, Poland, South Africa, Spain and Switzerland. The Enlightenment Stupa is the largest stupa in Europe, measuring 108 feet or 33 meters high. It was inaugurated on 5th of October 2003 and was a final project of the great Buddhist master Lopon Teshu's Renapoche. It is situated in Venal Madana, Malaga in Andalusian region of the southern Spain overlooking the coastal del Sol. As far as the Buddhism in Austria is concerned, it is a legally recognized religion in Austria and is followed by more than 10,000 Austrians. Although still small in absolute number, Buddhism in Austria enjoy widespread acceptance. A majority of Buddhists in the country are Austrian nationals, while a considerable number of them are foreign nationals. As in most European countries, different branches and schools of Buddhism are represented by groups of varying sizes. Vienna not only has the largest number of the foreign residents, but is also the place with the longest tradition of Buddhism in the country. Most of Austria's Buddhist temples and centers of practice can be found there. Some with a specific Chinese, Vietnamese, Tibetan or Japanese appearances. The latest development has been the establishment of a Buddhist cemetery around a stupa-like building for funeral ceremonies at the Vienna Central Cemetery. Buddhism was officially recognized under Austrian law in 1983. Russia is the only other European country to forwardly recognize Buddhism as native to its own soil.
giving it official status along with orthodox christianity islam and judaism by the late 19th century due to the influence of arthur schopenhauer and richard wagner artists and intellectuals in the capital city of austro-hungarian empire started to take interest in buddhism Carl Eugen Neumann, who had met the composer Wagner in his father's house, took great interest in what he had heard about Buddhism. In 1884, he decided to become a Buddhist and study the original languages to be able to see for him. He managed to translate large parts of Pali canon into German before dying in Vienna at the age of 50. In 1913, Java, Arthur Fitz, a man from Graz, became the first recorded Austrians to be ordained as Buddhist monk, taking the name Bhikshu, Sono. 1923 saw the foundation of a Buddhist society in Vienna and Austrians were among the participants at the Second International Buddhist Congress in Paris in 1937. The political situation and alliance between the fascist regime and the Catholic Church from 1933 to 1938 followed by Hitler's conquest of Austria and the Second World War was highly unfavorable to the development of Austrian Buddhism. Let's uh, just analyze the situation of Vienna after World War II. In 1949, the Buddhist Society of Vienna was founded and interest for Buddhism started to flourish again. Due to personalities like Fritz, hunger leaders who had returned from exile in the peoples in 1955 to become the society's president and Dr. Walter Garbarth who had spent years in Asia practicing medicines, Buddhism took a step out of literary and intellectual circles toward the world of daily life. The late 1970s saw the establishment of Danneberg's Platz, the first Buddhist centers in Vienna the purchase of a rural property intended to become a retreat center and the establishment of the first Buddhist association outside Vienna. The letter was founded by Frederick Fenzel, who had been a student of the Ryanko University in Kyoto and who invited Kosho Otani, the patriarch of the Nishi Honganji branch of Zodo Sinshu to visit Austria. Hema Loka Thero, Geshe Rabbitin, the 16th Karmapa, the 14th Dalai Lama and other eminent representatives from different Buddhist tradition visited the country, gave talks and attracted Dharma students. In 1979, Zenro Kodlela, who was ordained as Zen priest in California by Joshnu Sasaki, returned to Vienna, his city of origin and established the Bodhi Dharma Zendo there. The new Buddhist center at Flechmark in the very center of Vienna became the home for Zen, Kagyu and Theravada groups. Tibetan monks creating a temporary and mandala in the city hall of the Kidsvuhal, Austria in 2002. When official recognition was granted by the government in early 1983, a new era of Austrian Buddhism was assured in. A widely visible peace stupa was opened at the banks of River Danube and a retreat and study center, Ledzuhof, affiliated with the Zelok School of Buddhism, was opened in the western province of Voral Burj. Wanja Palmers, a Zen monk of the Japanese Soto School, and brother David Stendhal Rast, an Austrian-American Benedictine monk, founded a retreat center high up in the Salzburg Alpine region. The first, the first center in the south of the country, a retreat center in the Burmese Theravada tradition, was established in the early 1990s. In 1993, Austria hosted an annual general meeting of the European Buddhist Union, which drew participants from a dozen European countries. A series of visits to the city of Graz by the Dalai Lama in 1995-1998 and again in 2002 became a strong encouragement for Buddhists in Austria. Official recognition also opened the doors for Buddhist religious educations at schools. In 1993, the first few groups of Buddhist children were given the chance to hear about Buddha Dharma on a regular basis as part of the syllabus. 
12 years after the project was started in the cities of Vienna, Graz and Salzburg, Buddhist religious education is being made available to school children of all age groups, 6 to 19, at different types of school in all of the nine federal provinces of the Republic. A teacher's training academy was founded in 2001 to offer in-service teacher training for the teachers concerned. History is full of misnomers. One such term is a new world, as applied to the Americas. The landing of Columbus in 1492 undoubtedly created a new life on the continent. But it neither created nor discovered a new world. Many centuries ago, Asian migrants had come to the western shore in substantial number. What if the popular idea that Tibetans and American Indians have much in common in terms of their spiritual culture is largely a result of another historical scenario? What if Hindus and Hopis, Advaitins and Aztecs, Tibetan monks and Mayans were part of one world culture, a spiritual one? Nobody wonders, but it's true. Let's cover the contribution of the Indian culture to the world. We just go one step further. Baron Alexander von Humboldt, an eminent European scholar and anthropologist, was one of the first to postulate the Asiatic origin of the Indian civilization of the Americas. Swami V. B. Tripurari asked, what mysterious psychological law would have caused Asian and Americans to both use the umbrella as a sign of royalty? To invent the same games, imagine similar cosmologies and attribute the same colors to the different direction? Let's cover the Maya civilization to understand that fully. The first Maya empire had been founded in Guatemala at about the beginning of the Christian era. Before the fall of the Rome, the Mayas were charting accurately the synodical revolution of Venus. And whilst Europe was still lingering in the Dark Ages, the Maya civilization had reached a peak of greatness. It is significant that the zenith of Maya civilization was reached at a time when India had also attained an unparalleled cultural peak during the Gupta period. Indian cultural intercourse with Southeast Asia, the Gupta period, had begun more than a century before the Mayan classical age in 320 and Buddhism and Hinduism had been well known in neighboring countries for centuries. If there was contact between Mayan America and Indian Southeast Asia, the simultaneously cultural advance would not appear surprising. In marked contrast, this was the darkest period in Europe's history between the sack of Rome and the rise of Charlemagne. The most important development of the ancient Americans or Asio-Americans culture took place in the south of the United States, in Mexico, in Central America and in Peru. The early history of Asio-Americans is shrouded in mystery and controversy due to the absence of definite documentary evidence which was destroyed by European conquerors in their misguided religious zeal. However, it appears that after the discovery of introduction of maize into Mexico, Asian Americans no longer had to wander about in search of food. Men in America as in other parts of the world settled down to cultivate foods and culture, a byproduct of agricultural life, inevitably followed. Of the Asian American civilization, the best known are the Maya, the Toltec, the Aztec and the Inca. The Mayas were possibly the earliest people to found a civilization there. They moved from the Mexican plateau into Guatemala. They were later pushed out, presumably by the Toltecs, who in turn were dislodged by the Aztec. Let's cover certain similarities which are in between the ancient American culture and Indian culture. Under certain subheads, let's begin with the astrology first. Baron Alexander von Humboldt, while visiting Mexico, found similarity between Asian and Mexican astrology. He founded systematic study of ancient American culture and was convinced of the Asian origin of the American Indian high civilization. He said, if languages supply but feeble evidence of ancient communication between the two worlds, the communication is fully proved by 
cosmogonies, the monuments, the holographically characters and the institution of the people of America and Asia. In 1866, the French architect Eugene Valle de Dug also noted striking resemblance between ancient Mexican structure and those of South India. The second subhead under which we are going to point out the similarity between these two cultures are Hindu Mexican Trinity. Kirchhoff has sought to demonstrate that a calendarical clarification or classification of 28 Hindu gods and their animals into 12 groups subdivided into four blocks and within each of which we find a sequence of gods and animals representing creation, destruction and renovation and which can be shown to have existed both in India and Java must have been carried from the old world to the new since in Mexico we find calendaric list of gods and animals that follow each other without interruption in the same order and with attributes and functions or meanings strikingly similar to those of the 12 Indian and Javanese groups of gods showing the same four subdivision. Donald Mackenzie and other scholars however are of the definite opinion that the ancient Mexicans and Peruvians were familiar with Indian mythology and cite and support close parallels in detail. For instance, the history of the Mayan elephant symbol cannot be traced in the local tradition whereas it was a prominent religious symbol in India. The African elephant has larger ears, so it is the profile of the Indian elephants, its tusk and lower lip. The form of its ear as well as its turbaned rider with its angers which is found in Meso uh, American models while the African elephant was of little religious significance. It has been tamed in India and associated with religious practices since the early days. The Mexican doctrines of the world's ages, the universe was destroyed four consecutive time, is reminiscent of the Indian yugas. Even the repeated colors of these mythical four ages, white, yellow, red and black are identical with and in the same order as one of the two versions of the Indian Yugas. In both myths, the duration of the first age is exactly the same 4800 divine years. The Mexican Trinity, Trinity is associated with this doctrine as in the Hindu Trinity with the Yugas in India. The second uh, category under which we are going to familiarize with the similarity are the use of zero. The Mayas of the Yucatan were the first people besides the Indians to use a zero sign and represent number values by the position of basic symbols. The similarity between the Indian zero and the Mayan zero is indeed striking. So far as the logical principle is concerned, the two are identical, but the expression of the principles are dissimilar. Again, while the Indian system of notation was decimal, as was the European, the Mayas were Vegesimal. Consequently, there 100 stood for 400, 1000 stood for 8000, 1, 2, 3, 4 for 8, 8, 6, 4. While the place of zero in the respective systems of the Indians and the Mayans is different. The underlying principles and methods are the same and the common origin of the Mayan and the Indian zeros appear to be undoubted same. Disputes continued among scholars in the absence of conclusive evidence. As chronological evidence stands today, the Mayan zero appears to be anterior by several centuries to its Hindu counterpart. If we just see to the other similarity we find, uh, I'll just quote few scholars uh, also in between. In 1949, two scholars, Jordan Zekhom and Chaman Lal, systematically compared the Mayan, Aztec, Incan and the North American Indian civilization with the Hindu oriented countries of Southeast Asia and with India herself. According to them, the immigrants culture of India took with them India's system of time measurement, local gods and customs. Akom and Lal found signs of Aryan civilization throughout the Americas in art, lotus flower with knotted stems and half dragon, half fish motif found commonly in paintings and carvings. Architecture, calendars, astronomy, religious symbols and even games such as our 
the Mexican patility which is which can be compared with the Pachesi which have their origin in India's Pachisi. Both the Hindus and Americans use similar items in their wor uh, worship rituals. They both maintain the concept of four yoga cycle or cosmological seasons extending over thousands of years and conceived of 12 constellation with reference to the sun as indicated by the Incan sun calendar. Royal insignia, systems of government, practice of the religious dance, temple worship all showed remarkable similarities pointing strongly to the idea that the Americans were strongly influenced by the Aryans. The theories found in the Vedic literature of India, the ancient Puranas and the Mahabharat make mention of the Americas as lands rich with gold and silver. Argentina which means related to silver is thought to have been named after Arjuna. Indeed, the parallels between the arts and culture of India and those of ancient America are too numerous and close to be attributed to independent growth. The mythology of ancient America furnishes sufficient grounds for the inference that it was a child of Hindu mythology. The solar and lunar eclipses were looked upon in ancient America in the same light as in modern India. The Hindus beat drums and make noises by beating tin pots and other things. The Americas too raise a frightful howl and sound musical instrument. The Karkals, which Americans uh, think that the demon Malio, the hater of the lies, swallows the moon and the sun in the same way as Hindus think the demon Rahu and Ketu devour the sun and the moon. Let's pinpoint about one peculiar feature of ancient India which is called the swastik which you can find all over the world now over the years. Let's discuss about that in detail. The swastik is an equilateral cross with its arms bent at high right angles in either right facing form or its mirrored left facing form. Archaeological evidences of swastika shaped ornaments dates from the Neolithic period of ancient India. It occurs mainly in the modern day culture, sometimes as a geometrical motif and sometimes as a religious symbol. It remains widely used in Indian religions such as Hinduism, Buddhism and Jainism. Though once commonly used all over much of the world without stigma, because of its iconic uses in Nazi Germany, the symbol has become stigmatized in the western world, notably even outlawed in Germany. Historically, the swastik became a sacred symbol in Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and Shamanism, religions with a total of more than a billion adherents worldwide, making the swastika in both historical and contemporary society valid. The symbol was introduced to Southeast Asia by Hindu kings and remains an integral part of Balinese Hinduism to this day and it is a common sight in Indonesia. The symbol rose to importance in Buddhism during the modern empire and in Hinduism with the decline of Buddhism in India during the Gupta empire with the spread of Buddhism the Buddhist swastika reached Tibet and China. The use of the swastik by the indigenous born faith of Tibet as well as syncretism religion such as Kao Dai of Vietnam and Gong of China is thought to be borrowed from Buddhism as well. The symbol can also be found in many Buddhist temples throughout Korea. What is the relationship between swastik and Buddhism? Let's cover that slightly in detail. Buddhism originated in India in the 5th century BC and inherited the Manji or swastika also known as a young drunk in ancient Tibet. It was a graphical representation of eternity. Today the symbol is used in Buddhist art and scripture and represents dharma, universal harmony and the balance of opposite. One can see swastika on the pillars of Ashoka where the swastika is a symbol of the cosmic dance around a fixed center and guards against evil. This symbol that the right hand swastika is alleged to have been stamped on the Buddha's chest by his initiates after his death. It's known as heart seal. This would predate any other particular use ascribed to this in other texts. 
the paired swastik symbol are included at least since the liao dynasty is part of the chinese language the symbolic sign for the character van in mandarin man in korean cantonese and japanese van in vietnamese meaning all or eternity and as which is seldom used swastika marks the beginning of many buddhist scriptures the swastika appears on the chest of some statues of gautam buddha is often incised on the soles of the feet of the buddha and statutory because of the association of the right facing swastika with nazism buddhist swastika outside india only after the mid 20th century is almost universally left facing Albert Einstein says we owe a lot to Indians who taught us how to count without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made Mark Twain commented about this country in an apt manner land of religions cradle of human race birthplace of human speech grandmother of legends great grandmother of tradition the land that men with intellectual bent desire to see and having seen once even by a glimpse would not give that glimpse for the shows of the rest of the globe combined rightly said about india the history of india begins with evidence of human activity of homo sapiens as long as 75000 years ago hominids from about 5 uh, lakhs years ago the indus valley civilization which spreads and flourished in the northwestern part of the indian subcontinent from 3300 to 1300 bc was the first major civilization in india a sophisticated and technologically advanced urban culture developed in the mature harappan period from 2600 to 1900 bc this bronze age civilization collapsed at the beginning of the second millennium bc and was followed by iron age vedic civilization which extended over much of the indo gangetic plain and which witnessed the rise of major politics or polities known as mahajanpadas in one kingdom magad mahavira and gautam buddha were born in 6th or 5th century bce who propagated their shamanic philosophies almost all of the concept continent was conquered by modern empire during the 4th and 3rd century bc it subsequently became fragmented with various parts ruled by numerous middle kingdom for the next 1500 years this is known as a classical period of india during which india is estimated to have had the largest economy of the ancient and medieval world controlling between 1/3 and 1/4 of the world's wealth up to the 18th century Much of northern and central India was once again united in the 4th century CE and remained so for two centuries thereafter under the Gupta empire. This period of Hindu religious and intellectual resurgence is known among its admirers as the golden age of India. During the same time and for several centuries afterwards southern India under the rule of the Chalukyas, Cholas, Pallavas Pandyas experienced its own golden age. During this period, aspects of Indian civilization, administration, culture, religion, whether you talk about Hinduism or Buddhism, spread to much of Asia. The southern state of Kerala had maritime business link with Roman Empire from around 77 CE. Islam was introduced in Kerala through this route by Muslim traders. Mughal rule came to cover most of the northern part of the subcontinent. Mughal rulers introduced Middle Eastern art and architecture to India. In addition to the Mughals and various Rajput kingdom, several independent Hindu states such as Vijayanagar Empire, Maratha Empire and Ahom Kingdom flourished contemporaneously in southern, western, northeastern India respectively. Beginning in the mid 18th century and over the next century India was gradually annexed by the British East India Company. Dissatisfaction with company rule led to the first war of Indian independence after which India was directly administered by British Crown and witnessed a period of both rapid development of infrastructure and economic decline. During the first half of 20th century a nationwide struggle for independence was launched 
by Indian National Congress and later joined by Muslim League. The subcontinent gained independence from United Kingdom in 1947 after being partitioned into the dominions of India and Pakistan. When we talk about India, the earliest evidence to the history who controlled the ancient culture were the Aryans. There is a threat to unite Indians with the Europeans through Aryans. Let's try to go inside deeper in this uh, era and find out the details about it. The Aryans were semi-nomadic Nordic whites perhaps located originally on the steppes of southern Russia and Central Asia who spoke the parent language of the various Indo-European languages Latin, Greek, Hiti, Sanskrit, French, German, Latvian, English, Spanish, Russian etc. are all Indo-European languages. Indo-European are more properly Proto-Indo-European branches. In the wake of National Socialist Germany's defeat, the term fell out of general scholarly use in both senses and Indo-Europeans became the preferred designation of the language group. Indo-European are both the people who occupied the original Aryan homeland and their descendants who gradually spread out across Europe, much of the Indian subcontinent and parts of the Near East. Racial nationalists are not of course obliged to adopt the timid uh, contemporary scholarship and we should be aware of imprecision of Aryans as a racial or ethnic classification appears in various Indo-European languages. Traditionally Greek, Latin and Sanskrit were considered the closest languages to prehistoric existence and much of the reconstructed Aryan proto-language is based on them. Modern Lithuanian however is the most archaic living language closer to the original Aryan speech than any other. Perhaps the most famous proof for the prehistoric existence of this particular word is Rex in Latin, Raja in Sanskrit, Ri Re in Old Irish along with a host of other cognates. All are obviously variants of a common word for king. Since none of the people speaking these various languages were in physical contact with one another during the historical period, that is at a time for which written records exist, comparative philologists inferred that their respective languages must have evolved from a single proto-language, which is the only way of explaining the presence of the same word for king among such widely dispersed people. The Romans clearly didn't borrow Rex from the Irish or the Indo-Aryans, each had instead inherited their own word for king from a common ancestral language. Philologists can now moreover safely conclude that Aryans must have had kings prior to emigrating from their original homeland in southern Russia. In fact, a fairly detailed body of evidence about prehistoric Aryan political is a lost ancestral language from which organization, marriage practices, religious belief can be reconstructed on the basis of the survival of common vocabulary in the various extent Indo-European languages. They worshipped a sky god, they traced descent throughout the male line, they raised cattle, they drank meat, they used horse-drawn chariots as weapons of war, etc. Even the red, white, blue, green that appears in so many modern flags may have an Aryan pedigree. Aryans or more specifically Indo-Aryans make their first notable appearance in history around 2000 to 1500 BC as invaders of northern India. The Sanskrit Rig Veda, a collection of religious texts is still revered by modern Hindus records the gradual subjugation of the dark-skinned inhabitants. The Dasyus, that is Indra, has torn open the fortresses of Dasyus, which in their wombs hid the black people. He created land and water for Manu, lower than all besides, hast thou, O Indra, cast down the Dasyus, abject tribes of Dasas, after slaying the Dasyus. Let Indra with his white friends win land, let him win the sun and water. Indra subdued the thus used color and drove it into, into hiding. With all outstripping chariot wheel, O Indra, thou, 
far famed has overthrown the twice ten king thou goes from fight to fight intrepidly destroying castle after castle here with strength this is obtained from rigveda the shloka 1.53 the translation available the aryans were remarkably expansions and almost everywhere they went they conquered and subjugated the indigenous people imposing their languages their religious beliefs on the native and receiving in turn contributions from the peoples whom they conquered aryan invasions or more accurately a long sequence of different invasions by speakers of indo-european languages swept across old europe beginning as early as 4th millennium bc and over time the conquerors and the conquered melted into specific people with distinctive languages most of the contemporary inhabitants of europe along with their respective early national culture are the result of interaction between successive waves of aryan invaders and cultures of the particular wild peoples that they conquered and with whom they later intermarried As a result almost all modern European languages are members of western branch of IE family tree The birth of a European culture however predates the arrival of Indo-Europeans the cave art of Lascaux which some have identified as the first flowering of western man's creative genius was a work of old Europeans as were Stonehenge in the north and Minoan palace culture of Crete in the south a pan european religious symbolism had already evolved much of which was later incorporated into ie mythologies including various regional adaptation of old european reverence for the mother goddess many of the principal figures in greek mythology predate the arrival of aryans and during the course of ancient history old european religious beliefs and practices continually reasserted themselves europe is european because the conquerors and the conquered were members of the same white race different branches of the same family tree india is a morass of poverty because the bulk of the conquered with whom the indo aryans eventually intermarried were non white widows the lesson is obvious even today high caste hindus can still be identified by their caucasian features and light skins and the poorest the most backward parts of india are generally the darkest as an aside recent genetic studies have indicated that the basques of the aquitains and the pyrenees are probably the purest form of old europeans as they existed prior to the arrival of indo european invaders They evidently emerged from the invasions of Europe unconquered and they remained sufficiently isolated to retain their own unique non-IE language. We are comparing ourselves with the European culture so why not we just do something or just cover slightly about our own country called India its land the people The most striking element of Indian geography is a natural barrier formed by the mountain ranges in north of India. For India is a continental play that is crashing into the Asian continental plays as it does both continental plays push up the earth where they meet into a forbidding range of mountain. The central mountain range passing across in the shape of a sword near the northern edge of the Indian subcontinent is the great Himalayas. these northern mountains which are less of a barrier in the west have naturally isolated india from its neighbors all along the southern edge of the great mountain walls are rich soil that are generously drained on even though this region lies in the temperate zone this vast stretch of flood plains had been the home of the great indian empires which we call as a great fertile plain and the empire which governed this area with the mauryas the guptas the southern portion of india is a large peninsula with a forbidding mountain range all along the western coast and a large flat plateau called the deccan plateau india is one of the most culturally linguistically and ethnically diverse regions one can imagine four major peoples distinguished by languages they speak make up the population of the region 
The majority of the population are Indo-European, speaking a variety of languages related to European language such as Greek, German or English. Precisely when these people arrived is subject to much debate but they seem to have arrived somewhere between 2000 BC and 1600 BC. And they brought with them their own religion and social system. The bulk of Indian religion and almost all of its literature is Indo-European, second to the Indo-European but more ancient in India than the later immigrants are a people who speak languages from the Dravidian family of languages. While we cannot be certain the Dravidians were probably the authors of the great Indus Valley uh, river civilization contemporary with the Mesopotamian civilization to the west. In addition, the people in the northern mountains speak languages related to Chinese, Tibetan or Mongolian. Finally, the smallest group but most likely the oldest inhabitants of India speak languages from Australoids family which were the language spoken by indigenous people scattered throughout Southeast Asia and Australia. Australoids are still present throughout the mountainous forest of the Deccan but the traditional way of life which was still vital only 40 years ago is beginning to die out. It is this last point that perhaps is most interesting, the Hindu denial of the self-existence of the natural world. To people in a culture that values obvious trapping of wealth and visible emblems of material success, an acknowledgement of such a proposition can only come as frightful recognition of cowardly impotence of life in contemporary industrialized society. Hinduism provides a lasting critique of Western acquisitiveness. That all people should be morally accountable for their action is characteristic of Greek thought. For this reason, Socrates insists on accepting the punishment his fellow Athenians have meted out to him. Socrates is to the end a believer in democracy and the will of the majority despite his grievous doubt about honest self-questioning on the part of his fellow citizen. His friend Crito makes convincing arguments for cross Socrates' escape. Yet the sage remains clear thinking, hard headed and true to his moral principle. He accepts the sentence that has been given, given him. The art and artifacts from the Karani's excavations provide a useful summary statement about the culture of Rome, the great imperial city. Rome's greatness grew out of its imperial program of conquering others and establishing colonies. This military expansion at once brought great material benefit to the Roman state and guaranteed a pipeline of wealth for Rome, the imperial city. And Rome becomes a cosmopolitan capital where high living and material wealth became synonymous with personal importance and success. Note how the Karani's exhibit, uh, exhibit displays extravagant wall painting which did not decorate the walls of churches or temples but rather the homes of wealthy citizen. What the Romans also did was learn from other culture. You might wonder why Aphrodite, a Greek goddess, was mentioned or memorialized in a fantastic uh, sculpture in Roman times. To their credit, the Romans recognized the richness of Greek art and architecture and they sought to emulate the Greek master and the Greek style and theme in their own art. To a large degree, it was the Romans who brought Greek culture to world attention. Romans patronized Greek artists and artisans in the glorification of a vast world of their own, Roman creation. It's no surprise then that the Roman poet Virgil turns to Greek mythology and to the Greek epics as he fashions his own description of the origins and destiny of the Roman state. Virgil writes in his extended poem in part to win the favor of Augustus Caesar, the new emperor who emerges from the conflict surrounding the death of Julius Caesar. His other aim is to situate Rome in line with what was considered the great literary tradition of the time. India was a British colony. The British left behind them in India a strong imprint of their philosophy and culture. And even today it is evident that English which is a foreign language is the most important and respected language in India. But the British were not the only Europeans to arrive in India and have their imprint. 
Since ancient period, even before the beginning of Christian era, there were relations between Europeans and Indian. The main Europeans to arrive in ancient India were Greeks. The Greeks are referred to in ancient Indian history as Yavanas. Even the most famous ancient Greek conqueror, Alexander the Great, arrived in India, but actually he arrived up to the present India-Pakistan border. But there were other Greeks who arrived in India and established kingdom. Many of these Greek communities later on adopted Hinduism and integrated in the Indian caste system. Even today, there are communities in Kashmir who claim to be of Greek origin. Not all Greeks arrived in India to conquer it. There were also Greek scientists who arrived in India for scientific research, especially in astronomy and mathematics. Later on, other Europeans arrived in India because of commercial reasons. The Indian subcontinent was then world famous for its spices. But when the Muslim Ottoman Empire of Turkey ruled the Middle East, they caused lots of problems to European Christian merchants who tried to pass through their land. Therefore, the Europeans tried to find other routes to reach India and so accidentally Christopher Columbus found the continent of America. Columbus tried to get to India while sailing westward from Europe. Columbus presumed that because the earth is round, he would eventually get to India while sailing westward. Instead, he found the continent of America, whose existence was not known then to the European. Columbus thought that he had arrived in India and called the natives Indians. From the 15th century, the European representative arrived in India, namely English, French, Dutch, Danish and Portuguese. Among these European power, the Portuguese arrived first in India in 1498 via sea after they had circled the whole of African continent. These representatives arrived in India after they received from their country rulers charter to do business with India. These Europeans at first requested from the local rulers permission to trade in their entities. Later on, they requested from the local rulers to build factories. But after they built factories, they requested to build forts around these factories to defend them from pirates and other dangers. Then they requested to recruit local Indians to serve as guards and soldiers in these forts. And so on, they slowly created their own armies and so one of the European powers representative, the British East India Company became the ruler of India. The British control of India was a result of several factors. The Portuguese who along with their business tried to enforce Roman Catholicism on the Indians were defeated by local rulers, sometimes in collaboration with Protestant European powers, but still the Portuguese remained in India with small pockets. The main center in India was Goa, the Dutch who had holes in South India and the Danes who had holes in East India, left India for their own reason. The two main European powers that remained in India were British and French. These two powers tried different ways to control India and to defeat each other. Each of these European powers sometimes collaborated with local Indian rulers to defeat the other European power. Eventually, the British became the rulers of India, but the French, like the Portuguese, remained in India with small pockets and both these powers remained in India even after the British left India in 1947. The British East India Company was actually a trading company and it received from the British Crown Charter to trade with the Indian subcontinent. They arrived in India for spice trade in 1600, like uh, other European powers. Uh, that arrived in India, uh, they at first requested from the local rulers permission to trade in their entities. The British East India Company was more sophisticated than other Europeans who arrived in India. This company offered different sophisticated agreement to the different Indian ruling family, which made them the actual managers of Indian Kingdom. They sometimes used the army against local rulers and annexed territories, with the result that there was a lot of embitterment. Uh, among the Indians against the British. After that mutiny of 1857, the British Crown took back the charter from East India Company and ruled India directly through a Viceroy. The British gave India independence in 1947, but its last soldier left India eventually in 1950. The French also left India in 1950. 
Portuguese were the last to leave India in 1961. Even though the European powers arrived in India for commercial reasons, they also started converting local Indians to Christianity. Of the five European powers, the Portuguese were most enthusiastic to baptize Indians. The Portuguese inspired by the Pope's order to baptize people around the world not only fought wars against the local Indian rulers but also they tried to enforce their Roman Catholic prayers on Syrian Christians who were in India before the modern European powers arrived in India. After many wars, the Portuguese were defeated by local rulers and they had only one big pocket of control in India, Goa. It was made the capital of Portuguese colonies in Eastern Hemisphere. The Portuguese not only fought the Indian rulers, but they also fought against other European powers in India, especially Dutch and English. Many Portuguese churches in Kerala were converted into English and Dutch churches after they were captured by these powers. The English missionaries started acting in India at a much later period. The British arrived in India in 1600 and they allowed the missionaries to enter their territory only from 1813. The British allowed different churches to establish missionaries in their territory. The missionaries didn't only spread Christianity, but they also did humanitarian deeds, giving the needy the basic necessities of life like food, clothes and shelter. How can we forget the contribution of Mother Teresa? She belonged to the same fraternity. The missionaries also built schools in India and many of them exist even today and have Christian or European originated names. The British church missionaries succeeded less than the Portuguese in converting Indians to Christianity. But unlike the Portuguese who tried to enforce Christianity, these protestant convertees were voluntary. The Portuguese were also aware of the Indian customs according to which the wife followed her husband's faith and therefore married their men to Indian women. Most of the Portuguese baptized Christians in India have Portuguese oriented surnames like Fernandes, De Silva, De Costa and others. How there is a head and tail for a coin, there is both positive and negative impact of Western culture and Indian culture. So in my opinion, I think both cultures are unique in their own way and equally good. As far as Indian culture is concerned, it is an ancient and dynamic entity spanning back to the very beginning of human civilization. Beginning with a mysterious culture along the Indus River and its farming communities in the southern lands of India, the history of the subcontinent is one punctuated by constant integration with migrating people and with the diverse culture that surrounds India. Placed in the center of Asia, Indian history is a crossroads of culture from China to Europe and the most significant Asian connection with the cultures of Western Asian countries or Western world countries. Indian history then is more than just a set of unique development in a definable process. It is in many ways a microcosm of human history itself, a diversity of culture all impinging on a great people and being reforced into new syncretic forms. To some of the topic of discussion, I would like to tell you the reaction of two eminent Europeans about this great country about which we should be really proud of, that's India. Here it goes. The first thought is put forward by George Bernard Shaw. Everybody is aware about this famous dramatist, Nobel laureate in literature. He says, the Indian way of life provides a vision of natural, real way of life. We Western wheel ourselves with unnatural masks. On the face of India are the tender expression which carry the mark of the creator's hand. The second thought has been put forward by Professor F. Max Miller, a German philosopher and philologist. It goes like this. In the history of the world, the Vedas fill a gap which no literary work in any other language could fill. I maintain that to everybody who cares for himself, for his ancestors, for his intellectual's development, a study of the Vedic literature is indeed must. And definitely we all agree by this. Thank you.